our time seminar today. Um, today, it's our pleasure to have with us a number of people from uh, Eastman Chemical. So we'll talk a little bit about their careers in chemistry and engineering at Eastman Chemical. And um, our leader amongst all these groups from Eastman is called Evan McDougall. And Evan has his um, chemical engineering degree from Louisiana Tech here, which is a few hours across the, the border there. So remember, if you go to Louisiana, you take your passport with you. You get back to Texas that way. Another country over there, Louisiana. Okay. And um, he brought some of, his, um, some of his colleagues along. They're going to talk today about what life is like um, as a chemical engineer and a chemist and other things over at Eastern Chemical. Also, if you signed up for the bus tour, um, the bus will be leaving the Glassy parking lot back there, you know, between Glassy and the Rocker Fields. They'll be leaving from there at 1.30 sharp. If you want to be here, you know, before 1.30, like maybe 1.20 or so, right? So um, come on out for that, and we'll have you back by 2.50 so that you get time to go to your lab if you have that. Okay, so without any further um, <laughs> ado, let's um, welcome our student. <laughs> okay, so uh, as Gary mentioned, my name is Evan McDougall. I'm a chemical engineer at Eastman. Um, I brought with me some of my colleagues, an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, and a couple of chemists um, with me just to kind of talk about um, how did our education shape our career and what do we do at Eastman? If you're interested in these types of disciplines, what kinds of things would you expect to do on a daily basis if you come to work for a company like Eastman? Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about who Eastman or what Eastman is, what do we, what do, we do, what do we make, just for a couple of minutes in case you aren't familiar um, with Eastman and our presence in Longview. And then after that, um, our speakers will come up and we'll just kind of talk a little bit about what we do and probably leave 30 minutes or so just for Q&A and we can just kind of have a good discussion about our career. So Eastman is a global specialty chemical company. We're based out of Kingsport, Tennessee. Um, we're kind of small as, or medium-sized, maybe chemical companies go, about 15,000 employees. Um, just in Longview, there's about 1,500 employees at Eastman. Um, but we're spread out all over the, all over the globe. Um, we make all sorts of products, um, basically a lot of things that get used to make other things. So you won't go to the store and find anything with Eastman's name on it, but we make a lot of the raw materials that different companies use to produce all, all sorts of products. And I'll talk about what those are in just a minute. Um, so again, we're, we're spread out all over the world, located here in Longview. Um, our, as I mentioned, our head, headquarters are in Kingsport, Tennessee, um, up in the, right by the Blue Ridge Mountains, beautiful up there. Um, there's probably several thousand employees that work there, but all over, the, all over the globe we have chemical plants and sales offices and things like that. So here's a little bit of the uh, end market of kind of what we make. So we make products that go into these different categories. Um, you can see the first one is transportation, and you probably saw on the opening slide there is a sports car on there. So we make all sorts of things that go into vehicles. So we make um, additives that go into tires. We make uh, different resins that go into paints and windows and films, uh, coatings, inks, all sorts of things that you would find on a vehicle. Lots of building and construction, so roofing materials, uh, paint materials, um, just a whole slew of different products that we make. Uh, here's just some examples um, of some of the different products we make. Some of them we make um, here in Longview. Some of the products that are, you'll see on these slides we actually make in Kingsport or other places around the world. So one good example is maybe this uh, Safeflex uh, inner layer. It's basically a, a, a sheet of plastic that goes between glass. They use it to make bulletproof glass. They also use it to like uh, acoustically insulate the car so it makes less noise on the road. Um, they're also starting to put that with the new heads-up displays where it looks like a, a jet fighter cockpit where you can see like your, your speed and stuff on your windshield. So if you make that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of building and construction things. Something that we make here in Longview is Eastaflex. 
Um, a couple of weeks ago, I understand Mark Summers was here talking about the Airfin product um, that Eastman produces here in Longview. East of Flex is kind of the, the category um, that Airfin is included in, so we make that here in Longview with Longview raw materials. And one other thing that's pretty interesting that we make here in Longview is this Texanol ester alcohol. So if you ever paint a room, it kind of has that paint smell to it. Well, that paint smell comes from the Texanol, and the Texanol is actually added to paint to keep the paint stuck onto the wall so it doesn't drip down. So that's something that Eastman developed here in Longview many, many years ago, and we're still making it. All right. A little bit about the plant. Um, as I've already mentioned, we make a whole, different, a whole bunch of products. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, we're about 1,500 employees, and our plant is pretty large in terms of its total area. Uh, we cover about 6,300 acres of that. About 1,000 are really, um, I guess, developed in this plant area that you can see. But that's, that's the size of a pretty small city um, just on the south end of Longview. Um, you can see some of it from the highway as you're driving on I-20. You can see some of the columns as you, as you drive down. But it's, it's a pretty big facility. I'm not sure if it's still true, but it used to be the second largest integrated chemical site in Texas. So Texas got a lot of chemical plants, and this is a pretty big one. So that's just a quick overview about Eastman. Um, so now we're going to get into the important part of this, which is the career discussions. So um, I guess I'd like for my speakers to come on up, and we'll, we'll get started. Hey. Well, obviously, they know who's the best, because I get to go first, right? Uh, the rest of these guys, chemicals. Yeah, the list of them. I use them all the time because I know nothing about chemicals, and I work in a chemical plant. I'm an electrical engineer. I went to the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, my first question is, does anybody know what they want to do when they grow up? Good. Would you please tell me because I'm still trying to figure that out. Okay, I'm 61 years old. I've worked for Eastman for 37 years. Uh, I still don't know what I really want to do. Does anybody know what a slide rule is? Okay, did you say it in a museum? <laughs> when I started my freshman year, guess what they did? They went from slide rules to a thing called electronic calculator. <coughs> the first year. So that tells you how ancient I am. Engineering changes, not the principles. But engineering itself, what the problems are, what the tools you have, are all changing. That's what you learn in college. Did I learn anything in college that I use today? I did a Laplace transform. No, I'm just kidding. Anybody know what a Laplace transform is? You know how many times I've used that since college? Zero. <laughs> how much did I use from the University of Texas? Nothing. <laughs> so what does that say about universities? Universities train you to think, to seek out information. What does it seek out? New worlds and whatever, five years, you know, Star Trek. Okay. You've got to learn how to think. Problem solve. What do I do? I do problem solve. To come up with solutions. Most of the time, management doesn't like it, but that's okay. You've got to deal with management. So I had a decision to make. Did I want to be a design engineer, or did I want to go the management route? I decided the design engineer because I didn't want to lose half my brain and become management. <laughs> They're kind of getting some of this. So that's what you have to do if you're going to become an engineer and decide what to do. Electrical engineering is wide open. You can do like my brother used to do. He designs integrated circuits for cell phones. Okay. And this was back at the beginning of cell phones. Because again, when I went to college, there were no cell phones. You have computers. There were no personal computers. You got a stack of cards. You went to this place, this little room, got in your stack of cards, and you got a printout. One day I dropped my cards. So I put those all back together. Okay. So it's changing. Electrical engineering is wide open field. OK, you probably figured out I can't use a cell phone. My kids finally forced me to start texting. What texting? What's that? Every time my computer breaks, I don't know how to fix it. And I have to call IT or somebody to fix it. Or we have a girl in the office area, she comes to fix it. 
or the younger engineers come fix my computer. And then you're going to say, well, Greg, what do you do for Eastman? I make sure that all the emergency shutdown systems work correctly so the terminal doesn't blow up when Eastman blows up. I make sure that that plant runs because we put out, however many pounds it was a day, six million pounds a day are shipped out of that plant. They rely on my expertise to make sure the shutdown systems are designed correctly, tested, maintained, all those things, follow all the standards that are out there so that we make sure that we reduce the risk to an acceptable level so that we produce chemicals every day. My job is not to do electrical engineering. My job is to make sure Eastman makes product. Why? I want a bonus every year. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to design it. I shut down things, right? Well, if I shut it down and they don't make product, I don't get a bonus. I want to get paid. I want to make bonuses. My job is to make sure that company does it safely so that we make sure that employees are safe, equipment safe, and that the community is safe. And that's what I did for a job. Where did I learn that? Not college. <laughs> you're just beginning. What you're learning right now, use it and figure out how to get information. The internet's a wonderful place. We didn't have that. We had actually encyclopedias. That's what we used to use. <coughs> Nowadays, you have information at your fingertips. Use that, because an engineer, you must keep learning. You must be adaptable, and you must see what needs to be done to help your employer make money. Because if they don't make money, guess what? You don't get paid. And believe me, they pay me really well. <laughs>
which they're usually called capital project group. So if we have an issue, they come up with a project that they want done uh, to either default on that project. So it could be that the comps are too small, change too small, something is too small limiting what Eastman can potentially make. They'll get with the project team and they'll come up with the project team will come up with a way to make that actually happen. So whether we're installing comps, pipes, vessels, whatever. They'll get all that design spec and actually watch it be installed. It's pretty interesting watching it from concept. So you read through your textbook and you see, oh, well, this is why something happens for a particular reason. It's pretty cool to actually see, well, this is why it has happened and here's it actually happened from inception to grave. Um, from there, uh, you have the management side. I already said that. But you, if you want to say, well, I enjoy mechanical aspects, but I kind of want to help individuals. So you can be over a particular team. So it could be a project team or a another team, and you just basically help them. So you see the big picture, maybe not every little teeny tiny detail. But it's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. I have a lot of opportunities uh, within mechanical, within electrical, civil, everything else uh, within Eastman and also within industry. We'll say a little bit about Letourneau. I did really enjoy it. It was a great experience. I did ball hop here. That was a lot of fun. I'm sure some of you all know what that is. Uh, but now our chemists will come up and talk a little bit about chemistry. Uh, uh, so like Greg, I, I, I'll ask, uh, how many students here are chemistry majors? So we do have some chemistry majors. And um, uh, so I went to the University of Georgia. And that was quite a long time ago. Um, I, I've been at Eastman for uh, on year 30 now. Um, and as you see, uh, I got my BS current chemistry degree from Georgia. And when I graduated, I sort of knew a lot of work at a graduate school, and, but I also wanted to go out and work a while. So I started out and I worked for four years. And then after working at the bench as a BS chemist, um, I decided that what I really wanted was something more. So I did have the opportunity at that point to go back to graduate school. So four years later, I did go back to graduate school and I got my PhD. Now, after I graduated in 89 from Georgia, um, I was hired at Eastman. And I came in and, and in graduate school, I did laser induced uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. I came to Eastman and they said, you're going to be a chromatographer. So, uh, a lot of what I learned and specialized in college and graduate school um, really didn't apply to what I did um, with Eastman. And so for 14, 15 years or more, um, I was basically uh, working at the bench, um, you know, uh, doing uh, lab experiments, uh, analysis of samples um, for the last uh, 14 or 15 years, I've moved into the environmental lab. I do the environmental uh, work at Eastman, and I've also moved into the management side. So um, I'm a supervisor. I do less chemistry now than I used to, but um, as, uh, doing environmental work, we process all of the waste samples um, for Eastman. Uh, we, we operate all of our plants based on permits. Um, the amount of discharge we have into the reservoirs, into the Sabine River is all regulated by permits. Um, and we test uh, all the samples to make sure that um, uh, we abide by what the, the EPA, the TCEQ, uh, what our permits allow us to do. So um, uh, as, a, uh, as a chemistry major, um, we have, uh, and, and Paula West, uh, she's with me, she'll actually talk here in a minute. Um, from Laterno, uh, if you're a chemistry major, you can graduate with a, with a BS in chemistry, and if uh, Eastman does hire, we do hire some uh, BS chemists. Um, actually, the number of chemists that Eastman employs here at our Longview site is probably at its lowest level that we've ever had. It's just, it's, it's, it has shrunk. Um, we have uh, the environmental lab. We have the uh, 
analytical lab where we do all of our product and final product testing. And we do have a developmental lab. It's not as much research um, as it used to be. But uh, we do have a developmental lab that supports the operating areas. Um, and then, of course, at our other sites that you saw uh, at Kingsport, there are the, uh, many more chemists there than they are at, at the Longview site. But as a BS chemist, if, you're, if that's your, uh, your, your goal, um, and you're here in Longview, and, and you're interested in careers at Eastman, uh, you would most likely be hired in as a bench chemist, but it would be uh, at the, most likely at the technician level. Um, historically, Eastman has hired for their uh, research chemist, uh, B&T positions, um, PhD level chemist, um, but we have hired uh, uh, several BS chemists and Paula is one of them. Um, I will introduce her in a second. And uh, you have, you know, you can come in and, and you're at the bench working as a technician usually under the uh, supervision of a, a supervising PhD chemist. Uh, that's just how Eastman is operates. That's how um, that's how we do things there. Um, we do also have a chemist that uh, she has uh, gone from an analyst to a technician, and she has now moved in as a in a chemist role. Um, Candace Treat. Uh, many of you may some of you may remember Candace. Um, she is a Laterno graduate. She's in. Uh, been with us now for 10 years. In fact, she was one of my students. As a um, Eastman employee for 15, 18 years, I actually adjunct taught here, so uh, most of the students I'm sure that I've ever taught are long since graduated, but um, we've had several students that have hired on uh, with us. Uh, uh, Drew Story, he hired on. Um, we've had several um, uh, summer uh, students that came in for a summer program and that's also uh, an opportunity for particularly junior, sophomore, junior, senior chemistry students uh, if we have positions for the summer as, you know, as a summer position and that would give you some experience in industry. So, but anyway, th those are some of the things that we do. Um, again, um, in the environmental chemistry, it's uh, it, it, it's a different world, really. Um, we have rules on making rules. We uh, everything we we do is, is is governed strictly by you know uh, government agencies, and uh, we have to follow those rules. And and uh, it's it's a lot of detail and, and a lot of I's and dots and T's cross and making sure that the data we send out is accurate and complete. So, but anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what I do. And I want to uh, let Paula West come up and talk. Um, she, uh, from, she's been with us for 10 years now. So, and she is a BS chemist. job and you'd be surprised how difficult it is to find a job. So I hired on with Eastman in 2008. I've been there for 10 years. I just had my 10 year anniversary. Whenever I hired on, uh, Eastman really wasn't in the business of hiring a lot of technicians off the street. And so that's, when we say we're hiring a BS chemist, it's not technically what we, Eastman considers a chemist position. Um, they consider you as a BS chemist, you would be in a technician role now. When I hired on, I hired on as an analyst. So I worked my way up on the bench from being an analyst to a senior analyst, to a technician, to a senior technician. Even two years ago, I was promoted to an associate technician. So my roles have changed a lot in 10 years. I went from doing bench work, um, ICP, OES, uh, bench work, and BIMS, uh, atomic absorption, cold vapor mercury analysis to um, moving into the organics group later on. 
I was named the deputy technical manager of our metals area before I moved into the organic area. And so then I started working on GCMS technology. <coughs> um, let's see, GCFID, uh, lots of different environmental testing. So I have a lot of different hats that I wear. Um, <coughs> One of my roles is to support Jerry and what he does because I am the deputy technical manager of the environmental lab now. And whenever he's gone, I have to make some data usability decisions. We have to look at our permits. We have to look at our SOPs, our rules, our regulations, and the data and decide is this good or not? You know, can we use this? Um, let's see. So that's a little bit about me and kind of where I started and where I am now. Uh, right now, I'm hoping that I'll end up being the quality officer for the environmental lab. So there is a ton of advancement if you hire on even, you know, I know it makes you cringe a little bit to think, well, I spent, I spent four years in school and they're not even gonna call me a chemist whenever they hire me. So, <coughs> but you have to put it through that filter of, you know, that's the structure of the company. That doesn't mean that you're not a chemist. So just because I'm technically an associate technician, there's a lot of people that show me the same, they defer to me the same way they would defer it to somebody that was a chemist. At the end. So if you, you know, if you learn a lot and you keep working and you keep learning new things, and that's the best advice I can give to you is be as flexible as possible. You know, don't ever stop learning. Don't ever stop going for more opportunities because it will serve you well in your career. So. We have about 30 minutes, and I'd like to have my speakers come back up. I think oh, we can do Q&A at this point if I'm sure you have any questions and ask us. Um, you, can, you can direct questions to one of us or to all of us just to get our perspective, so use this as an opportunity. See if it helps you with uh, if you're trying to figure out what major you want to go into or what you want to do with your major you're already in. Any of those kinds of questions? Just want to open up the floor. Thank you. Did you guys always want to be engineers or did it just... So the question was, did we always want to be engineers or did it just come to you? Well, I, I, can, I guess I can start. Um, I did know I wanted to be an engineer. That's my best friend from high school. He he was going to La Tech and he was going to stay in the engineering dorm. And the only way I could room with him is if I declared engineering as my major. So that's, <laughs> how I, that's how I became an engineer. Uh, lo and behold, it turned out to be a great experience and I really enjoyed it. Um, but no, I didn't. Um, I just maybe I had a technical knack and I kind of knew that, but I didn't know an engineer, especially not a chemical engineer at the time. It's not until I got into college and met some people.
landed in the chemistry arena because I had one professor that every single test that I turned in, he would write at the top of my paper, chemistry major, question mark, question mark. <laughs> so finally, I went to his office and I talked to him and I was like, why do you keep doing this? And he said, because you, he said, you just don't understand with your mind, this is a good fit for you. And he said, if you, if you don't want me to encourage you to do it, then don't. And so I started taking a few more chemistry classes and just fell in love, you know, with chemistry. So, um, so I started that as my major. By that time, I had enough credit hours to have a triple major in psychology, psychology, and chemistry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and it changed a lot. And I'll, I will uh, go with what you said earlier, and what I did in school is nothing... I had no idea what I would be doing career-wise. So what you're learning here is how how to fix things. You're learning how to learn new things. Um, you're learning how to think. You're learning how to think through a problem instead of letting that problem intimidate you. So, um, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And my experience was much the same way. I was a sophomore in college before I decided what I was going to do. I, I, really had no clue. I, I, I knew I um, liked uh, science. I tried geology and I tried food science. And, and actually, University of Georgia did not have any kind of an engineering program. They had an ag, and engineer, an ag engineering program, but wasn't interested in that. So, um, you know, had I grown up out here, maybe if I had it all to do over again, I, I, my personality traits probably would maybe fit a engineer a little bit better than a chemist, but when I took, uh, I decided to take organic chemistry, and I decided to take organic chemistry for chem majors, so I took the higher level, and like Paul, I absolutely fell in love with it, and I said, well, this is what I'm going to do, so that was, after that, it was, you know, nothing but chemistry. Can I add one thing that, uh, one thing that Paul and Greg said about how what you learn in school may not necessarily be what you do when you get out into the industry? Um, I would say in, in some situations that isn't the case. There are certain job roles where a lot of the core things that you talk about in your textbooks and what you learn in the classroom are going to be what you're actually going to be doing in the industry. Not, that's, that's actually my case. So in the process design type of role, we're doing a lot of those core chemical engineering calculations all the time. But 99% of the chemical engineers in the plant don't do that on the basis. They're solving problems. They're learning how to solve problems and put problems um, and apply them to uh, manufacturing. I would agree with the Evan on that as well. The, um, you know, I, I knew people who would study for tests and they would just try to memorize it and thinking that, oh, all i got to do is get through this test. You know, and, and as soon as they took the test, they would forget everything they studied for, you know. But certainly in chemistry, that's, that's not... <laughs> That's not a good idea. Um, you know, a lot of what Paul and I do in the environmental world, of course, you don't learn that in college. Um, and but the foundational principles, you know, about behind what we do, you know, each and every day with our testing and and whatnot, uh, and just many of the general chemistry principles. I still, you know, open up a general chemistry book from sometimes and and look something up. You know, so you, you can't. Yeah, there are certain things where uh, in your area, in your curriculum, that, you know, it just becomes a part of you and it's not, you know, you, you learn it and, and, and do apply it in <coughs> your daily work, so. Question over here. What is it like having to come into a, come into a job or a, a career placement and all of a sudden or, uh, find out, uh, no, this isn't what you learned in college. This is your job now. What is it like having to learn that as a job? I can answer that question because that's I felt a little overwhelmed when I first started on the season. Like I'm going to be doing what, and you want me to what, and how am I going to what? So um, Eastman has a lot of a lot of guiding documents that are going to help. So, and Eastman's not going to toss you in an office and throw you a bone and say, now build me something. 
they're going to give you a mentor. You're going to have a support system. So you're not going to be expected, you know, day one to hit the ground running and already know everything. It's going to be a, you'll go through a growth process and a growth period. And by the time you get to the end of that, you'll feel a lot better about it. I, I mean, mentors are, are a huge thing. Eastman's huge on that. They're not going to put you, you know, in the basement and say, okay, now just do it. We're very invested in our people. We're very invested in developing our people. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you that's been my experience with this money. Uh, I mean, here, you wouldn't believe how much money they have spent sending me to school. Like, um, one, two, three day school, maybe a week school. Uh, it's very true. I mean, you get a lot of support. I actually learned more from the electrical designers when I first got started than some of the engineers. Yeah, you're going to come out and I don't know exactly what. But remember that when you get that diploma, you're being hired because they know that you've gone through the meat front. Because at the University of Texas, there's 50,000 students. There was uh, about five to 10,000 engineering students. I don't know a bunch. They put you through the meat front. You come out, corporate America knows that you are teachable, that they can help you go where you want to go. And is it hell up either? I'd say my, my experience is similar to Paul's in that. Uh, my first job had very little to do with what I, I learned in school. Um, I was in a role um, where we did Six Sigma work, which that's very <coughs> familiar. If you're not familiar with uh, Six Sigma, it's very statistically oriented uh, process control, manufacturing process control. I didn't know anything about statistics when I got out of college because that wasn't really a core portion of what we learned. But um, very similar to what Greg and Paul said, we, I was trained very quickly on what my job tasks were, and I was expected to apply those after I received the training. But I mean, in my first year, I'd say maybe three or four weeks of, out of the year was dedicated training to get me to do my job um, better and understand what I was expected to do. I'd say that I didn't feel super useful for probably about a year. Uh, you, you graduate college, you don't know exactly what you're going to be doing, what you learn in college, it's not always what you're going to be doing in the field. Like I knew how to draw a pump on a graph and how to draw a turbine, but actually seeing them in the field since I'm working maintenance and have to work on them, I get questions from mechanics, how do I fix this? What do I do for this? This car? I don't know. I've been here a week. <laughs> so they are very good about getting you mentors that you work with. Uh, sending you to training. I've been to a ton of training as well. And even though I've been there seven, eight years now, I still don't have to know everything. I have a couple areas that I'm supposed to be an expert in, and then I have other areas that I draw from people that have been there 20, 30 years. So it's, it's been very good to work with you and give you good guidelines and people to work with. Yeah, there's, you're, no man is an island there. Everybody's very, we're all very interdependent on one another. So, I mean, even with the labs, I've I have people call me and ask me questions, and I'll pick up the phone and call somebody all the way across the plant and ask them a question. So you're, you won't be able to. Question over here. I was wondering, so since it seems like this job is you're always learning new things, are there any particular things you're looking for on a new college graduate's resume? Are there projects or ways of working or buzzwords that will want you to select that candidate more than others? That, that's a good question. Um, so I can I can say from personal experience, first-hand experience, that what employers are really looking for first and foremost is experience in terms of internships. Um, if it's not an internship, some sort of research activity. Um, it's not research activities over the summer during college. I mean, experience on teams. Um, and I would say because if you were, if you even got to the point where you have an interview, it means your GPA is good enough and you're not going to talk about your GPA very much in the interview. You're going to talk about what I did, who I worked with, how we accomplished things. So it's really, it goes back to experience. Um, I'm, I'm on the Louisiana Tech Advisory Board um, for Chemical Engineering, and that's something that we tell the students every year when they're coming in, is focus on getting experience before you leave college, because it's the number one um, factor that will lead to a full-time career. I can't help you because it was 37 years ago that I had to apply for a job. 
Can you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> not the most important. Um, so if you have a 4.0 and you have no other experience, you might not be the top candidate. So it's a combination of having a good GPA and also having experience, whether that's internships, uh, projects that you worked on, extracurricular activities, playing a sport, just something that shows that you are well-rounded. You aren't just, I guess, excelling in one particular area. So, I mean, I'll add to that and say, you know, even if you because I didn't have any internships under my belt when I was hired on. What I had going for me was two years of summer research. You know. um, so that's you know very useful. I had a lot of extracurricular stuff that I did. Um, they're looking for people that are well-rounded. <coughs> Not just my grades are stellar and I did, I did you know, research or I have an internship. But what else, you know, because they're going to say in your interview, hey, tell me more about yourself. What do you, what do you do in your free time? You know, it's going to be, there's going to be a few minutes of that getting to know you. So, um, and uh, then they want. That's the chewing gum I found under the seat. <laughs> and then they want, um, you know, they want to know how you think. Can you think? You know, they're going to ask you some specific questions to kind of jog your mind. How did you work through certain issues? And they're going to ask you how you interact with other people. So. They're going to want to know, you know, have you ever had a conflict with someone? What did you do about it? Because they're probably not wanting to hire someone that's got anger issues, you know. So. But I would say the appropriate response to have you had a conflict is yes. I hope you have had experience working in teams before your first interview or your first internship. Because they don't want to find out. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that to be your learning experience. You want to go through that process during high school and college through working with others before you get out and have to do it with people who are paying. That's a good question. What about uh, prior military? Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, prior military? Prior military experience? Okay. Um, prior military experience? No, I. The, interviews that we've done for new hires that I've actually never had in progress. We've had people that had previous experience. Uh, I don't think they would hurt. I mean, being military is always a good thing in serving our country, so I don't think that would never be a just, uh, detract from your resume. Uh, but that wouldn't also, I don't think it would necessarily add anything to being military in, 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 in and of in itself, itself. Depending of on itself, right. what you did specifically in the military, right. could add to it. I mean, but based on your experiences and, and what you, you know, and Eastman, I'll say this, Eastman is a military friendly employer. Um, they they do a lot for you know employees that get deployed. We do have a lot of you know, Army Reserves and uh, National Guard employees at Eastman. And they do get deployed, you know, and, and we do support them. I don't know if you are the exact group that would know the most about this, but uh, do you know what your interns do during co-ops and uh, during summer internships, yeah. et cetera? I can, I can answer that because I've been a couple of interns last couple of years. We actually give them some projects. They're usually smaller projects, and then they have uh, engineers. They don't usually put me with them because they think I might destroy them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they'll put them with a younger engineer, and they actually get to do some projects. And so they get to see uh, what we really do as engineers, and it's good for them. It's good to get out there and get an internship because you start seeing what you would really be doing as an engineer. I can add on to that. I was an intern back in 2015 for Eastman before I came out for um, But I completely agree. I got a taste of what real engineers did before I had graduated. I mean, the same, the same projects that we were working on as interns, if we didn't finish them, they would be finished by a real engineer. So it's really the same, uh, same breadth and somewhat to the, uh, somewhat depth as, as well um, in terms of projects that you might see as a full-time engineer. Um, but really, it's there's a great 
mentoring program where you are paired up with somebody, usually it's somebody that's doing the same role as you, that they're going to walk them through, hey, this is how you're going to apply what you've learned so far in college, you know, you haven't learned everything yet, but uh, we're going to walk you through how to, how to work through an engineering project in front of the front desk. And it was a really great experience, I'd say that's probably the reason why I came back to work through this, because I enjoyed the internship so much, I realized, hey, this is what we're doing, if I come back, I'll do this full time, and I enjoy it. types of engineers work at Eastman? Okay, that's a good example. I, I can tell you off the top of my head, um, most of the engineers at Eastman are going to be chemical. Um, behind that's probably mechanical, I would guess. Um, there's electrical engineers and there are civil engineers. There are a few environmental engineers as well, but that's one of those areas where a lot of chemical engineers end up doing that kind of work as well. And there are some industrial engineers also. What about computer science? I'm not sure as much um, at, at this site, but definitely at corporate headquarters in different areas, there are there are needs for that kind of role. Um, I just can't speak to that at this it's site. Oftentimes, for whatever reason, um, just that maybe that's how your career path took you. Um, you can be a chemical engineer, and you'll end up in IT, and you know doing IT stuff. Um, so I mean that. The, those, you know, those paths, I mean, and they just happen. I mean, they, you know, situations and, you know, particular point in your life, you know, cause something to change, and instead of in manufacturing, you know, you may be doing something else. Uh, that's a good point, because we don't, we don't stick to, I'm not going to just touch chemical engineering stuff on the career. I'm sure I'll get moved around all over the place. We have chemical engineers that are in uh, marketing. I've heard of that. We have mechanical engineers in, like, supply chain. That would Right. It would be like an industrial engineering type of role traditionally. We have chemical engineers in IT, we have electrical engineers uh, in process control, which is more of a chemical engineer thing. So we, we just kind of do a little bit of everything throughout uh, the length of our career. And, and IT is a great thing to go into. I mean, we're stuck with IT, especially with all the things that are happening. I mean, you can't, if, if our computer doesn't work, I, I'm going to tell my boss I'm going home. You know, because Everything is on the computer now. That's not the way it was when I started, but it is now. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's extremely important. So we hear about a little amount of self-actualization and all this stuff. What would you say are the things that add most quality to your life as a part of your job? Or even what does your job allow outside of your job that gives you the quality of life you're looking for? I would say um, for my job, it's more of more about the company, Eastern where I work. I think I, how that adds to my life is they're very respectful of the uh, work-life balance. And that's, that's what's really important to me, honestly. Um, that and it's something that if I didn't like where I work, I probably wouldn't want to live in Longview and work East and I'd be somewhere else. Um, but because I'm continually challenged, um, it gets me up out of bed in the morning and kind of motivates me to go to work. And I enjoy what I do. I don't know if that's where you're going with that, but well, what drives me, some people ask me what drives me, it's not management, it's not being promoted, you know, I like that and I like more money, but uh, what drives me as an engineer is to go work with the actual operators, the people that are doing maintenance, the people that are doing construction, the people that are out there day in, day out, doing what most people think is not a very good job. They're the ones I get the most information from. They're the ones that you solve their problems and they keep coming back to you and say, thank you for doing that. That's where you get your benefit from. And that's benefit the company because we're fixing the actual problem. Management comes to me, we throw their ideas out, go talk to people down here, then we find the real problems. We find what's really going on with those plants, not what management thinks is going on. You know, well, we may should have talked a little bit and information, what, about 1,500 folks at the Longview site, what do we have, maybe 250 B&T folks, is that about right? It's about 300. 300, so B&T is business and technical, uh, they're exempt, salary is paid employees, and the majority of those people would be engineers. Um, 300, I bet you 200 
250 of them or more for engineers. So probably the, the other ones are chemists, and we probably had 10, 15, 10, 12 chemists in the whole, out of, you know, 300. The other, you know, 1,300 folks are most of them are operators and mechanics. Um, they're the ones that are out in the plants and running, you know, running the, the uh, daily operation 24/7, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The plant operates. Um, it's continuous, and so these operators are ones that the engineers often get their information from and work hand in hand with, um, as, as well as the chemists in some cases. And it's worth mentioning out of those 1,500 people, I mean, naturally we're going to have dozens and dozens of managers. And of those managers, I can only name a few that don't have some sort of technical background, <coughs> engineering degree, right. chemistry degree, that kind of thing. Um, we, don't, we don't have a lot of people that graduated business and came to work and run right. the plant. Well, Most all of our managers are chemists and engineers. They all came from the bottom when they started this engineering All right, so you guys are all at the bottom. <laughs> 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 Reminder to those who are going to go on the bus tour, be there at last year about 1.20, luckily about 1.30. And uh, let's thank our speakers one more time.